We asked uh, um, some people from industry, which is me, and then we have academia, and we also have the federal government here. So um, Brian Reamer is a MI from MIT. He's at the Age Lab, and Jeff Michaels is the associate administrator for um, programs and yeah, yeah, research and program development. Research and program development. Thank you. So what we're going to do is we'll ask a couple questions here, and in the middle we have a little extra time compared to some of the other uh, panel discussions. We'll uh, take some questions from you out there, and then if there's any time left, we'll ask some more questions. So let me start with Brian. Uh, so Brian, there's a lot of hype out there about autonomous vehicles, and if you if you pay attention and you re you're reading it, it says you know the thinking is in the next five years I'll be able to get in my car and say take me to the local grocery store, and I'll be able to sit back and take a nap. What's the reality? Well, there's a little I'll promise you, but uh, I will promise you that in five years from now, everybody in this room is not going to get in their car and say, take me to the grocery <laughs> store. Within 150 years, past the time that many of us are alive, the likely scenario is one of that. So the future outlook to autonomy is, is very bright, but it is not a change that is going to occur overnight. It's got to work with the political and socioeconomic factors to change how we live and move over a period of time. Now, it's not so long ago that Sergey uh, Brim at Google came out and said within five years, and that's kind of the basis of the five-year number, everybody's going to touch this technology. And while many of the folks in this room are touching aspects of the technology already today and, and vehicles they've purchased in the last few years, it's going to take many moons to really change in a cost-effective way how we live and move and shift the mobility infrastructure to one that is highly automated. Um, and it's going to be fun to watch and create enormous need for policy change, enormous need for research. And the technology that's leading the way today may be the bull that's kind of leading the market. It's going to take a lot of people to catch up. So Jeff, uh, how long before we see a positive impact from autonom autonomous vehicles in the, in the injuries and the fatalities? Uh, I, th I think it's going, to, um, it, it's going to start soon. In fact, that it's already started. Um, there's sort of a continuum uh, with vehicle automation. And there are basic levels of vehicle automation that have already been introduced, electronic stability control, for example. Um, was mandated in all cars uh, in 2011 and is now in a um, little less than 50% of our vehicle fleet across the country and is already saving about 2,000 lives per year. So that, that's pretty good. In, in highway safety terms, saving 2,000 lives is, is pretty good impact. That's with 50% um, penetration in the fleet. I think what we're gonna see is a, um, a continuum uh, but we're not, it's not going to be a jump from conventional vehicles to self-driving vehicles. It'll be a continuum of technologies introduced over a period of decades, and each of them will provide some safety benefit. So I, I think we, <clears throat> we you know, probably should keep our focus on that ramp up at this point. It's, it's really not so relevant from here when we'll have a complete fleet of self-driving cars. I mean, that's going to be a long, long time away. Um, the average age of cars are 11 and a half years, I think. Um, I think our, our current fleet, in our, in our current fleet of cars across the country, we have 50 million cars that are pre-2000. So, you know, it's a lot of inertia there. We got, so it's not so relevant when we'll have a complete fleet. It's kind of more relevant how we use this ramp up and how clever we are with deploying um, these safety innovations as they become available. And I think what's really intriguing here and, and often misconstrued in the media here is the kind of the concept between automated and autonomous. Yeah. We are not moving anytime quickly to a autonomous vehicle concept, the driverless concept. It's gonna take time. But automated technologies, as, as Jeff said, from electronic stability control to um, advanced auto braking systems, depending on how you wanna frame them these days, are making impact. When we think about our communities and how we can begin to motivate safety, it may be challenging 
how we encourage the purchase and deployment and education of new vehicle technologies that contain the basis of automation. And learning how to change how we live and move to successfully adopt these technologies without altering our risk patterns along the way. And that's going to be the real challenge to successful adoption of these technologies. So Brian, um, with all the new technologies and the quick implementation of these technologies, has that pace of change of te technological adaption and adoption changed the way people have to learn? Absolutely. Um, you know, we were talking last night, you know, 100 years ago we were talking about adding the electronic starter to a car. You know, that was a planning cycle. You had to manufacture the starter. You had to figure out how you're going to build it into the package. You deliver it. Well, there was a technology education component that came with that, but, you know, the reality is it was one size fits all. Now, in a software-driven ecosystem, and, and perhaps, perhaps, one needs to even think even closer to that, a robotics-driven ecosystem, because automation is not a software problem. It's a robotics problem. We're making changes to fundamental systems through the air overnight, or at least in terms of some manufacturers in dealer delivery upgrades. So fundamentally changing the interface characteristics of the vehicle when you go in for service or when you wake up the next morning. So I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stay away from brands here, but there's one manufacturer's vehicles that we've been working with that in June we went in to have oil change basically at the end of the day, and they flashed the software system care. They gave us a nice little pamphlet and told us how they changed the interface related to navigation applications. But they didn't tell us that they turned off the auditory warnings for lane departure, or that they fundamentally off altered the automated driving system. So by one definition, it worked better. But if you walked in and you had a mental model of how to work with this technology, when you drove into the dealer, they very much altered that model, never gave you an indication that you really needed to alter how you were leveraging the technology, or be more cautious in different situations in how you were using the technology. Nor did they take an individual who probably had a bad experience with this early on because it was not a cohesively deployed system and tell them, hey, you know what? It's better now. Here's why you should retry it. And one has to remember the primary education motivation in vehicles for better or for worse is experiential learning. And it's not how we should be learning high technology. Go out and try it in a place where it may or may not be designed. You know, this is not how we need to learn safety-centric, high-tech technology. Yeah. And I think that's really pivotal to how we begin to think about automation down the road. The myth about automation is with more automation, you need less human expertise. It's a myth. We need to change driver education. We need to look at lifelong driver education. We may need to look at continuing education models constituents are not going to like this, but if we want the safety benefits that come with automation, responsibility in the proper delivery and deployment of the systems can't be ignored. Um, unfortunately, if we don't address some of the hard problems that go with the technology, we're not going to reap all the benefits the technology can provide. So, so, I agree with that. I think we agree with most things. Uh, but the, from my perspective, I'm not a technology geek. I'm a government bureaucrat, which is probably worse. <laughs> and, and I'm I, neither. I, I, I know, sorry, I'm, the, I'm the only one in the room who <clears throat> has a tie on today. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. Obama allowed us get to get those up. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. It, it, in Washington, nobody takes you serious unless you have a tie on. So. <laughs> it's the only place so, I put one on now. <laughs> so uh, so I mean, I'm coming at it from a different direction. but. So from my perspective, vehicle automation is, I, mean, I, I honestly believe, after 30 years of behavioral research, I honestly believe vehicle automation is, is the next generation of safety. I mean, that, that, that's a, in my mind, that's a certainty. Um, I, but I think we have to set the bar high. I mean, the, the advantage of automation is that it fills in the gaps in human performance. It, Humans are very good at some things and not so good at others. And you know, driving, you know, is mostly in that other side. But we're not so good at that. You know, we're we're not <clears throat> so good at 
at diligence in a low demand situation. I mean, as you, as you know far better than I, Brian. And so um, I think the most effective automated systems will be ones that don't require us to read complicated instructions. We're not very good at that. And so I think we need to set the bar high. Automated systems, you know, need to complement and in fact fill the gaps in human performance, not demand more of us. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, the aviation community has proven time and time again that the interaction, we need to know when to turn them on, when to turn them off, when to trust them, when not to trust them. And, and yeah. you know, okay, it's a cold day with snowflakes in the air. Was the system designed to work in that situation or is it my responsibility then? is some of the model and understanding we need to have. When do we leverage this vehicle system? When we do we not leverage that? And that's some of the complexities we need to build into this. Now, one of the real interesting aspects here, and I think the, the, the CEO of Mobileye came out with a piece a couple weeks ago. Um, it's on archive, um, if you looked up. We're basically forecasting the current trends in automation in the vehicle are, are trending to the potential of another AI winner. The automation community right now in vehicles is under the model of automate because we can. And it is well known in the automation literature, and, and the folks at NTSB have commented uh, to some degree around this recently as well. We need to be thinking about automation where we should. And there's a very big difference in that model. You know, automate because we can, let the technology drive. Automate where we should is where you're beginning to bring the human the policy and the technology together to make the cohesive decisions to what makes sense. Now, long term, I believe strongly the technology will win. But if the technology leads the boat as it is right now, it has a large possibility of becoming technology that sits on the shelf because the consumer is not ready for it. And that's the danger that we have yeah. very much today um, that I think the, the folks in the room here can very much help. Media hype's not a good thing here. So, so Jeff, we have uh, a lot of experience with um, campaigns on seatbelt usage, for example. Uh, it's up over 90%, 92% uh, nationwide. Uh, and other, um, you know, we're adopting new technologies, airbags, people were afraid of airbags at first. What lessons can we learn from some of those past experiences and use to help us with uh, getting consumers uh, both educated and uh, aware of the technologies? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I'm gonna come at it from sort of the other direction. Um, we, we have made a lot of progress over the past 30 years with sort of adapting humans to our transportation system. You know, we built this transportation system, <clears throat> and, it, and it's killing us, literally. I mean, it, it, so 30, 40,000 people a year, now we're getting back up close to 40, um, 40,000 people a year die on our roadway system. Well, we built this system. I mean, this, this isn't you know, some natural force that's causing this calamity. We did this. And so we've been working all along, well, not all along, we've been working for the past several decades on, you know, improving human compliance with this system we built. And we, we've done that pretty well. Um, we've, you know, we, we found we got to get people in seat belts. And so we developed um, a technique, you know, the, the National Click It or Ticket Program, which is high visibility enforcement, law enforcement program, which, you know, um, it's really kind of a social norms adjustment and that worked really well. We did the same thing for drunk driving. That, that did really well. Both of them have kind of, you know, we, those are good things, um, but we found that there's a point of diminishing returns. There's a, a, a sort of a, a new progressive thought about road safety um, that started in Sweden um, 20 years ago, the Vision Zero safe system movement that um, is now being adopted in the U.S. and there's, there's cities across the country that are that are sort of following parts of this um, concept, but it's really sort of looking at it the other way, which is you know, acknowledging that we need to build a system, not only the vehicles but the roadways as well, that accommodates humans. 
that you know we need a system that is is built for us, not one that we have to serve. You know, and so we need a system that that uh, that recognizes human weaknesses in performance, that anticipates them, and that prevents serious injuries when they happen. And that you know the, the Swedes refer to that as a a safe system, but that is you know. Um, that's not an easy change, but there's movement in that direction. And um, the, if we hope to get close to zero fatalities, which I think is achievable um, uh, in the US, we're going to have to look further in that direction. Yeah, and I think that's very much in line, Jeff, with the concept of automate where we should yeah. versus yeah. automate where we can. And, and quite divergent from the current uh, media hype technology trend around driverless. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe we have two microphones in the, uh, one over there and one other. People want to start asking questions, I'll ask one more. So Jeff, you mentioned Vision Zero. How, how can people in this room, they're, they're from local community, how, how can they get involved in uh, that initiative? Well, there's, um, there's a lot of literature. It depends where you know who you are and how you're coming at it. If you're coming at it from an academic point of view, um, it, um, it, there is a body of, of um, scientific literature about this concept of human-centered transportation system design that is quite interesting and, and needs more participants. At the city level, there's a um, a nonprofit in San Francisco, the Vision Zero Network, um, Leah Shayam is the executive director, that links, um, I think currently about 20 or 25 cities across the country that are doing various aspects of Vision Zero. In fact, I, there is a movement here in Cleveland, I happened to, to Google it before I came here, uh, that um, there's a bicycle organization here in Cleveland that is, um, I think, trying to get the movement going here. Um, uh, <clears throat> but there is a, a network through um, this Vision Zero network organization that you can plug into to find out what others are doing and, and get resources, find the connections to your local transportation, highway safety officials, find where there are uh, public sector resources, and get started. Okay. So maybe we'll take a couple questions from the audience. All right. Um, I know you said that we are a ways off from autonomous vehicles, uh, and I can think of some short-term reasons why cities might want to get behind that technology. Uh, but cities like Cleveland, its inner ring suburbs, have been devastated by out-migration, sprawl, um, and public policies that encourage sprawl. And so I'm wondering, long-term, can you give us maybe some reasons why a city might want to get behind this kind of movement um, that might mitigate the dangers of making it easier for you know the lazier among us to get from Amherst to Cleveland. Unfortunately, I think automation will be an enabler to more sprawl than it will be a solution to that. Um, you know, I, I live in Boston. Um, real estate values in Boston, downtown suburbs, are known to be very high. If I didn't have to drive and I could turn that time into productive time, by sure we're gonna move five, 10, 15 more miles outside the city. Now, other communities, that's gonna to change to some degree, but it is a very hard political roll of the dice now how to begin to plan for a very, very unknown future. So, um, Chris, I, I'm kind of narrow in my perspective. I've spent my career on safety, but I recognize that there's you know other aspects of mobility, um, including equity. And um, I, one thing to look at is the city of Columbus, as an example. Um, Columbus um, received a you know, won a national competition a couple of years ago, the Smart City Challenge, and they received a um, um, support from the Department of Transportation. I think of forty million dollar. Um, grant to help them pursue their proposal. Their proposal was um, was very comprehensive and addressed equity issues um, as well as safety and economic issues. In fact, as, as I recall, one of the um, um, 
the, the objectives of the Columbus program was to provide health care access um, specifically to one neighborhood uh, in Columbus, which had a, an infant mortality rate that I think was four times the national average. So I, I think that um, um, there is some movement in that direction. It's, it's, it's you know, they're not quite well-developed guidelines, but, but I think there are some examples of success that could be um, followed. Doesn't the technology around um, subscription service uh, that the automakers are moving to uh, companies like Uber and Lyft, the potential to reduce the cost of mobility from an average of $6,000 a year to $3,000 a year, stand a much better chance of being uh, more disruptive, much faster to uh, decongesting our cities to uh, making, lessening the need for parking garages, causing them to, or parking lots, opening them up to uh, new development, uh, have the potential to be much more uh, uh, immediate topic than automated uh, vehicles. Well, th those two ideas are, are not necessarily different, um, and I, I, I agree with both of them. I think the, um, these transportation services, transportation as a service, uh, has great potential. Um, you, know, it, you know, in some respects, it's an extension of carpooling. You know, it, it has great potential um, for societal benefit. Automated transportation as a service has even further potential, I think, and so I, I I think that they are both um, uh, valid models, and you know maybe they'll merge one day. Yeah, and I think that's where uh, cruise automation, Google, a few others are trying to play is really automated mobility on demand um, services. You know, but the hard part is is that you take an Uber driver of today, which is you know, largely subsidized transportation at this point. Um, and even if it wasn't subsidized, um, you still take a low-cost employee in a older, less technologically adverse vehicle. And that's a system that is very difficult to beat with a high-tech solution. Now, everybody says, well, the technology will get cheaper. No, it won't. Look at the price of your new iPhone. Stop with that mystery. Okay. Case study point uh, drone warfare. Um, some of the governmental reports that have come out recently, drone warfare is more expensive than conventional warfare. Why? The complexity of keeping the systems up to a technological readiness requires an incredible investment. That means the folks that have to calibrate and short sensing technologies are working, validate safety systems. On top of the fact that you still need a low dollar or an hour employee to clean the cars, you still need traffic management solutions built on top of this that are much more technologically complex. So the, you know, the value proposition to automating mobility on demand is absolutely there. But I think anybody's under a, a very forward-thinking eye to think that the, the cost and the P&L ratios on that is going to work out in the near future. It's out there. Um, now, in context of mobility on demand as it exists today, cities such as Boston, we have a reasonable public transportation system, I'll put reasonable in quotes, but it is not convenient enough that it beats Uber across town most of the time, or walking for that matter. So if you want to weigh these, you know, the different mobility options together, you know, steel on steel rail is by far the most efficient, but it's got to have the elements of consistency, predictability that we get in many of the European cities. Love going to London. The tube's always there when you want it. You go down into the T station at Kendall Square and wait 15 minutes. You only do it once or twice to say, I can't take the risk. Um, so we got to look at the future and how we bring the system components together to make the right choices for the environment, mobility, the right choices for me at that point in time. And you know, with you know, aspects such as Waze, which was talking about earlier, or other connectivity applications that are truly predictive of reality hey, what's the fastest way to go right now? Give me the information, I'll make a better point of decision. I think we need to wake up this side of the room. There's no <laughs> questions on this side. Uh. Thanks. Um, 
I think it was you, Jeff, who said that our transportation system is killing us. And I thought what you were going to talk about was actually the fact that our transportation system has worked physical activity out of our lives, which is killing many more of us than even the huge numbers that are being killed with, in traffic crashes. And I think as we brought the automobile into full use in the United States, we were not thinking about that health impact and that huge societal cost. And uh, I don't know that you have the answers to this, but I think as a as a group of people that are thinking about the future of transportation and thinking about automation, what that means in terms of even further distancing people from moving themselves around um, with their own physical activity um, as we, one the prior question was about sprawl, but I think in a much broader way, we really need to be thinking about what does it mean for the way that we all get around and how much we sit in a chair versus moving our own bodies. So just wanted to make it a, a point as, as we're talking about technology and transportation that the unintended consequences of sort of infinitely flexible automated mobility, there are some other costs that are associated with it that aren't actually the technology costs or the infrastructure costs. Yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I fully agree with you on that. Um, uh, I think historically there, there is, you know, uh, there are interesting reasons why we have the system we have. Um, I, we clearly need a system which enables us to do the right thing, you know, and, and um, getting exercise and staying healthy is, you know, among those right things. Um, you know, just sort of in, in my part of the world, um, you know, I'm thinking about this safe system idea, which very much includes bicycling and pedestrian mobility. Um, achieving that safe system is quite difficult because we've, our transportation system has developed in, in at least three columns. You know, it, um, um, it, historically we needed, pub, we needed you know, large amounts of money to build roads, and so that money came from taxation and went to Congress. So, and it, you know, a sort of a funding loop established, was established, and there were con congressional benefactors. There was a, a federal agency started the Federal Highway Administration to handle this, and there began a what is now like a forty billion dollar funding loop that you know many thousands, tens of thousands people are plugged into to you know to build roads to to maintain the roads that we depend on. So that was sort of built with its own constituents, you know, uh, its own incentives and rewards. Meanwhile, there was a vehicle column established, and that was, you know, established, you know, really in response to consumer activism in the mid '60s with Ralph Nader and, and on safety and speed, and and that's where my agency came from, and that's where vehicle regulations came from, and that has a separate congressional constituency, a fin separate funding cycle. Um, later, there was a, a behavioral program, the one that, that I run at, at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. That has y yet a third one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a, a third set of congressional benefactors, a third segment of an agency, a third set of constituents who don't really have a lot to do with vehicles or roads. So, Building a a you know comprehensive integrated system, which leads us to do the right thing, and involves vehicles, roadways, um, and behavior, is difficult. But we got to find a way to do it, and that, that's you know I, th I think there's just a lot of inertia that we have to get past. And I think that it, it's a difficult problem here in the states. I mean, the Europeans are definitely ahead of us, and in, in, in some of the Asian countries as well, trying to integrate pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, more effectively and safely together. But we got to also look at personal responsibility. And one of the aspects that I study is the context of how we're communicating non-verbally between road users. And if you want to play the jaywalking video to give you an example, you know, in many of the locations around the world, you know, the context of walking out in traffic, not acceptable. In the context of Boston, looking through video to understand, okay, what's the intent on jaywalking 
and the complexities that automation may need to consider in predicting intent of someone to step off the road. And this is you know, point in case one of how personal responsibility, you know, strong multimodal design, trying to keep the cyclists separate from the bicyclists, separate from the parked cars, all moving in straight lines, predictably, something that we got to get the behavioral side, the vehicle side, and the highway side working cohesively together. And that's hard when the funding streams are very much separated. It's a major, you can be in the roots, state right, federal right policy issue. Um, and again, if we want to reap that vision zero side, personal responsibility is going to be case in point. Um, and this goes from distraction the phone to stepping off the curb. Well, I, I think we're at a, um, a turning point. And I mean, I, I feel that way. I feel like we're at this turning point and vehicle automation is sort of illuminating it. It's, it's, it, it's not the sole cause, but, but this structure that we're talking about, this, this um, the explanation as to why we have the system we have, um, I think that was necessary. I think we had to do it that way. Um, that, that was the way we could get these things started. I mean, it would be hard to start the whole system with, with you know, um, one set of governance and one set of administration. It was necessary to break it up into pieces to get it going, and it got going well that way. I think we, we really did quite well under that structure, but we've outgrown it. And so it's time now to change to a, to a structure that meets a greater range of needs, and we've got to figure out how to do that. So I think a challenge from the, from the technology, I mean, I, the technology is the institute name I come from. And, and technology, according to the party lines at MIT, is clearly going to lead the way. Um, and it is leading the way today. But here's a challenge to the foundations, policymakers, activists um, at heart and, and, and in cause, is how do we balance the speed of change here with the complexities that are involved? If the speed of technological change continues to drive the equation, I guarantee you we will not see the benefits in many of our, if not all of our lifetimes. We'll make too many mistakes to get there. How do we begin to slow the model down just enough that we can think through the steps, convince GM, Ford, Chrysler, and Toyota to talk together about the policies and standards needed so that the same manufacturers or, or, or other manufacturers don't make the same mistakes twice because we can't afford that. So how do we slow people down just enough to get things right but not too slow that we overburden the ability of technology to succeed here? And I think that's, that's a place that, that foundations, public policy, needs to kind of try to how to motivate this equation. We kind of have a tendency to tack from too slow to too fast too quickly. And, and Jeff can't talk about what's going on in Congress as much as I can. I'm one who holds <laughs> that, that what Congress is doing right now seems like a good thing, but it may be too much too fast that has backlash potential later on down the road. So how do we kind of find this pivotal point? And health policy is where I would call the walking, the cycling, the health aspects has to be part of that. Yeah, I, I know I've got one more question coming up. I'll make this short, but just one further point on this. Um, you talk about sort of slowing things down to control them. Um, there's an interesting movement in the public health community um, sort of uh, transferring knowledge about implementation science to transportation. So if you view, if we view vehicle automation or automation more broadly as a public health intervention, then controlling its dissemination and implementation makes a lot of sense in the same way that other evidence-based public health interventions have been controlled and, and accelerated. So that may be sort of a, you know, uh, an outside force that, that can help us, that can help government, that can help industry um, develop models for, um, for technology needs development and for technology targeting and deployment. 
Now let Scott close his ears for a minute here. But when, when Mark Rosekind took over at NHTSA a few years ago, uh, met with him at one point, he says, okay, what should I do? And one of the messages I gave back is start considering the FDA model and the elements of the FDA model that work in terms of auto technology, which means self-certification becomes documentation academically reviewed documentation on why it's efficacy, and you bring a panel of experts together to review that. Now, there's a lot of negative aspects that the FDA may be a little too conservative, and that's a whole debate we can get into at a different time. But how do we begin to treat technology in the car, automation at its finest, and other behavioral aspects as the public health policies they are? You know, in some sense, many of the technology innovations that we see in the car are some of the best medical devices that have ever been created. How do we start treating them like that? And it's an area we need to think much more deeply about. So we've got three questions in five minutes. So uh, <laughs> let's have the questioners ask their questions. Yep. Maybe there's a convergence and we get quick comments. I think okay. you were here first. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, you know, I think obviously uh, um, autom uh, automatic um, vehicle technologies have a role to play in reducing fatalities and accidents and things like that. but. You look at somebody like Volvo and, um, you know, who has, I think, been a leader in this, and I made a comment on the website, um, but their vehicles are actually getting heavier. They are still putting high-strength steel in the vehicles. They are still improving the structure of it. And so, you know, even a company like that is still concerned that, you know, while it can mitigate injuries, while it can mit mitigate fatalities, it's still not enough. And, mm -hmm. you know, looking at places like the Netherlands, looking at places like Sweden, um, Sweden, in particular, is not a big country. It does have industry, um, but it is a rural country, largely. And, um, you know, the sorts of best policies that they've adopted, you talked about safe systems. Mm -hmm. um, I think, are we really kind of fooling ourselves, you know, how much of a difference aut um, automatic or autonomous vehicles are going to make? Is it something where, you know, we know how to build roadways, we know how to build complete streets, we know how to build bike paths? Um, as a former, you know, developer, I'm keenly aware of the challenges that uh, the software uh, problems present. Should we be focusing more on, you know, building bike paths, building complete streets, building these systems that, you know, when people are distracted, when they are looking at their phone and walking around, that the punishment is not potential death? I mean, is that something that is, you know, a better payback to, to focus on the things we know how to do than kind of the speculative, we're not sure when it's going to, to work? Take a look at a piece I had in Fast Company I was quoted in a couple weeks ago. It's right on that point. So why don't we? Uh, speaking of new technology in vehicles, uh, the average age of a vehicle on the road today is 11.6 years. It's been going up and up and up for at least 20 years. Uh, I'm one of these people. I, my, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. My household has to have a car. We have one car. It's a 2000 Toyota. Um, it'd be nice to buy a new car with technology that makes the car more safe. Uh, and we're a relatively affluent uh, household, but we're squeezed. Housing in the Bay Area is very expensive. I think the average age of vehicles on the road in America is, is so high because people generally feel squeezed. So are there ways of improving vehicle safety that don't involve making new uh, cars with great technology? There's a big investment in aftermarket technologies going on right now, and that may be the way to improve safety the fastest. But it is a very difficult area to work in because, you know, proving safety efficacy in a range of use cases from Cadillac to Lincoln to the Ford Fiesta or the Toyota Camry is very difficult. There is a vehicle to infrastructure deployment coalition at the national level looking to roll out the infrastructure side of the vehicle to infrastructure communications. Their focus first is on signal phasing and timing to slow down the drivers for an eco approach and eco departure because they're going to know how many seconds until the light turns red and it's no use to speed up. So that's uh, one thing working in favor of safety. The next priority uh, would be er early warning of reduced speed zone ahead. And 
I would argue, uh, as California is considering, that should be informed on the basis of the mode share of pedestrians and bicycles, mm -hmm. not just the speed at which the vehicles are traveling. So you'd probably like summary comments at this point. <laughs> yeah, we're a little over some. But I think that these three commenters were um, uh, together you know, sort of neatly cover the comprehensive range of considerations that need to um, be considered going forward. Um, it's, it's clear that we can't just depend on, on self-driving technology. We also need to be looking at, at the roadway. We also need to... Um, uh, be looking at, at human behavior, particularly in the short term. That is, you know, at vehicle automation, as we, we started out um, recognizing, vehicle automation is se several decades away. You know, a, a large proportion of self driving cars is a long way away. Uh, in the meantime, we're losing 10,000 people per year in crashes in which the, the driver is over the legal limit. We're losing 3,000 a year because everybody's not wearing their seat belts. We're losing you know, 3,500 at least in distracted driving crashes, uh, up to 10,000 in speeding related crashes. The, these are behaviors for which we have countermeasures. They're, they're not 100% countermeasures, but they are effective. And we, we can't back off on that commitment. We've got to keep that stuff going until at least the technology displaces those human fallibilities. And I think as a summary, that's why the medical model is so important here. If you pop a pill any day, is no one to say that pill is perfect. It's yeah. not. The goal is to have something that's highly efficacious that allows things to move in a positive direction. There is no mystery that automation and autonomous will change everything about how we live and move, from the infrastructure to how we license to how we education educate the constituent. The question is when, and if anybody gives you the answer there, they're not telling you the truth right now. We don't know. So I think we're a little bit over. Thank you very much for your attention this morning.